This is the FCB Radio Network, home of the best personalities, and where real talk lives. Online at fcbradio.com. FCB. Welcome back to another episode of Marvel Hall and Silver Screen. My name is Sarah Lee. Uh, still in Atlanta, not traveling back to D.C. just yet. Until the madness of a little going as my <laughs> Still down here in the South. And, you know, if you know anything about me, you know that I'm perfectly comfortable down here. So, <laughs> um, sometimes I feel like it's easier to laugh down here. So, so here I am. Um, things are pretty nutty out there, but there's some good stuff happening too. So I'm going to talk about the nuttiness and try to contextualize it in a sort of good frame, um, so that maybe we can feel a little positive about some things. Um, uh, so yeah, so the things I want to focus on today, um, I do want to talk about what they're calling the Freedom Convoy, the truckers up in Canada. I know there's some discussion about one maybe developing in the U.S. from California to D.C. I know some people are like, no, God, please, no. I think it'd be fantastic, personally. (laughs) Um, Not because it wouldn't be inconvenient. It certainly would be. I think we would definitely see even more uh, empty shelves, but... I mean, something's got to give, y'all. So, um, so yeah, I think it would be great, and I would support them 100% of the way. Um, so I'm going to talk about that first. Um, I also want to talk about an article that I, I saw it when it came out in early January, but I didn't address it, and I don't remember why. I don't remember why I didn't talk about it on the show, because it's basically tailor-made for the show. Um, But it came out on Barry Weiss's Substack. Uh, A couple of Hollywood writers, um, L.A.-based writers, kind of tackled the subject of woke Hollywood. Uh, So I want to talk about that again and going to frame it um, as part of the discussion about what Biden's planning to do um, with his Supreme Court pick. Um, because I think they're connected. So I want to talk about that. Um, And then sandwiched in between those two will be just a short discussion on the very magical, very fun to watch. Thank goodness Disney is, you know, still making films like this. Um, Encanto. So we'll talk about that. I'll give you my thoughts on that film. So um, yeah, But before we jump into all of those things, we're going to hear from our sponsors. So y'all stick around for a few minutes and I will be right back. Okay, and we're back. Um, So, yes, so let's talk about freedom trucking, shall we? Very fascinating story out of Canada. Um, Basically, my understanding is that Justin Trudeau, um, the Canadian prime minister has implemented a vax mandate at the border. And I want to say Biden has done something similar. I think that's right. Um, but the truckers don't like this. You know, they're, they're, um, there's a lot of questions about the vaccine, as everyone knows. Again, let me reiterate, I'm not encouraging you not to get it. If you want to get it, get it. The point I always try to make is that it it's an assessment of risk. It's a choice that people should have the right to make. Um, there are Certainly plenty of debate about, you know, what happens if it's a a virus that's way more uh, transmissible and deadly than coronavirus. Um, I guess we can have debates about that. But this particular vaccine didn't do what it was advertised to do. So and I think most uh, most experts in epidemiology are acknowledging that the coronavirus uh, situation is, if it's not completely over, it's it's on its way out. That's why you've got countries like England and Finland and Denmark and um, uh, you know Ireland basically lifting. Sorry for the notification there. <laughs> Just try to ignore that. Lifting all of their COVID restrictions. So. Um, so yeah, so this is playing out um, with that as the backdrop, that this is over. So the Canadian truckers have decided to protest this fax mandate. And my understanding is they're just 
they're just kind of lining the roads. That's all they're doing. They're not being violent. They're not, they're certainly not behaving uh, in the same way that some of the uh, protesters during the summer of 2020 did in America, um, you know, where buildings were burned down, where an entire, you know, several city blocks in Washington and Seattle were taken over by Antifa. Like, they're not doing that. Nonetheless, uh, Justin Trudeau said that they're an insult to truth. He's insinuated they might be racist. He's insinuated that they're, you know, risking the lives of other people, that maybe they're even uh, responsible for deaths. I mean, it's really ugly. So they show up in Canada headed toward him, and he hightailed it out of Canada and came to the U.S. to a safe house. Then it was reported that he actually had contracted COVID. Um, but, you know, he's still he's still talking. So... There might be one being planned as well for the United States. I don't know if this is going to happen, but it would go from California to D.C. is what I'm hearing. Personally, I would support this. I know it would be a huge inconvenience. Um, I know that we would probably see even bare shelves in the grocery stores. But I also think that something has to give. Okay, like this, it just can't go on like this. This it has become very, very clear to me, and it should to everyone else, should be to everyone else, that because we know there are countries who are absolutely dropping all their restrictions, we know that the vaccine as advertised didn't work. Uh, we know that the um, the case, that, that Omicron, the newest variant, is not deadly, not certainly not as deadly as uh, Alpha. Um, it should, everyone should be questioning why the country of Canada, why blue cities in the United States like D.C. and L.A. and Chicago, why they are now doubling down on restrictions. Um, this is not, it hasn't been about public health, I don't think, for a while. And what's happening is the cracks in the uh, sort of lie that it's about public health are beginning to show. And so... They're having to sort of wrest all of the control that they can. A lot of people think it's because in the United States, at least, they see their power slowly dissipating as we approach the 2022 midterms. Justin Trudeau doesn't even have that excuse, quite frankly. Um, he just seems to be, uh, I'm sorry to say, he seems to be a bit of a coward. Um, he, he did hightail it out of the country, as I said, and um uh, he also doesn't seem to be able to make decisions uh, on the fly and that are close and personally sort of meaningful to him. Um, everything he says pretty much follows the party line, right? The sort of progressive, very left progressive party line. So it doesn't strike me as a particularly deep thinker. He just sort of He's an, an attractive man. Uh, this happens frequently. Um, you know, attractive people get things. They get elected sometimes. They get jobs sometimes. Um, uh, you know, they're they're good speakers and they know how to um, how to spin a golden tail and they look good. And so there you have it. So I'm sorry to be so dismissive of Justin Trudeau. I, if he's uh, some sort of policy genius, um, someone please correct the record. But that's what I see happening with him. And so now that it's come literally showing up at his door, the, the policies that he's been promoting and probably not knowing very much about the consequences because he doesn't choose to, they literally show up at his door and he runs away. So in the grand scheme, this is a very good thing. I think it's given a lot of people some hope that it's not, they're not just going to roll over us like a tank, if you'll forgive the, you know, very direct allusion to Tiananmen Square. Um, that there's going to be a little bit of a fight. Um, and it's great to see it coming from Canada. It's great to see some of the European nations dropping all the restrictions. What's disheartening as an American is that we're supposed to be always supposed to be leading on, you know, the charge of freedom. That's that's our banner. And we are behind in this fight. And I think it has everything to do with who's currently sitting in the Oval Office. Um, but anyway, that's the big story right now. And I know you're probably... Um, you know, inclined like like a lot of us are to be inconvenienced by the bare shelves and um, just the turmoil of the supply chain stuff. But please do remember that these um, these people that are out there protesting in the only way that they know how without burning down cities, we should be supporting that. Um, 
if, if good people don't stand up and fight for their ability to live their lives and to keep their jobs and to not be mandated to, you know, introduce, um, you know, a shot of something into their bodies, um, it, it, that, that's a personal choice, I believe. If, if we don't stand up and support people for doing those kinds of things, then when the situation is something meaningful to us, like maybe you don't care about vaccines, it's not a concern for you. Okay, fine. So you get your vaccine. But when it comes to something that does mean something to you, I think the parents at schools are a really good example of this. When it comes to that, you may find that if you did not stand up, there will be no one to stand up for you. That's a that's an old saying. It's more eloquently said in a different way. I'm sure you've heard it, that first they came for me and I did nothing. Or first they came for my neighbors and I did nothing, to butcher it. Um, but that's true. So we do have to stand up and we do have to say, yep, that's good. Yeah, I'm inconvenienced, but that's a good thing. And you should lend your voice to that if you think it is. Um the other thing that's very obvious to me is the way that they're being characterized by people like Trudeau and others, these truckers. They're calling them an insult to truth. That's Trudeau. Uh, you know, the insinuation they might be racist. That should give you every indication that this is not about public health. It is about control. And it has been for a long time. Um, because that is an absurd thing to say. If you want to criticize what they're doing, the only argument you can use is they're not listening to, you know, I mean, Fauci, as much as I frankly despise him, um, he's been consistent on his message, which is, you know, public health, public health, public health. Of course, he has the benefit of years and years and years and years and years in that industry. Um, but that's really the only rational argument to make if you don't like what the truckers are doing. So anytime someone goes out of that zone and says it's about race or these people are trying to kill people, I mean, I suppose that's an argument for public health, but you see what I'm saying. Like the minute you hear it framed in terms of sort of the woke culture, um, you know it's not really about public health anymore. All right, so we're going we're gonna to leave that. We're going to do a little bit of... Um, exploration of a very fun Disney movie, which I have some thoughts about the whole like, you know, the uh, feminization of the culture or whatever that I hear people say a lot and that it's kind of being implanted into our kids at a young age and that Disney's to blame. So that may be true. I, I don't know. I mean, I, I've, I've certainly seen some evidence that, you know, there are movies where, you know, boys are not portrayed as as strong and interesting characters. Um, and Encanto is, it, it's not, I wouldn't go that far. I think that, you know, I thought about the characters after I watched it. And I'm like, yeah, all of the really interesting characters definitely are women in this movie. The males in this movie are either very young and they need the ladies, they need the girls, or the men are kind of bumbling idiots. Um, there's the dumb hunk that is maybe going to marry a sister. But that's not unusual for a girls movie that's intended to empower girls. And that actually, in a weird way, makes sense in relation to the argument that boys and girls are different, right? Like, that's one of the arguments against sort of this gender fluidity idea, that boys and girls are biologically different. And when they're young, when they're the age of, you know, enjoying a movie like Encanto, which, by the way, I really enjoyed, so I guess I can't really say it that um strictly but when they're young boys are like or girls are like oh icky boys and boys are like nope you're not allowed in the treehouse like they don't you know what i'm saying that's the normal part of growing up so this movie is a bit of a chick empowering movie it's not like i think how to train your dragon that's more of like a boy movie where it really celebrates boy stuff right and I love that those movies exist too. And they're and especially when they're well done, which which that one is, How to Train Your Dragon really is. I think there's a second one too, maybe even a third, I can't remember. Anyway, <laughs> Encanto is a very charming film. And it was nice to see this, you know, teenage girl. Um, she's Latina, um, the Madrigal family, and they're a magic family. Um, and she's the sort of keeper of the flame, although she doesn't know it, of her family, right? So it's very, it revolves, the music's fantastic. It's Lin-Manuel Miranda. And look, I don't know. I don't care what you think about his politics. I have my opinions on them as well. He is a 
fantastic writer of musicals, okay? The man can pen a song. Uh, we Don't Talk About Bruno is very popular for a reason. So it's very enjoyable. The characters are lovely and fun. Um, there is a real love for uh, sort of the Latin culture in this, which I think Latin culture is marvelous anyway, right? Like even when it's not being celebrated in your face in bright colors and awesome music, there's a lot about that culture that's just it, it is what it is. Just like every culture has wonderful things about it. The Latin culture, you know, is just, it's got a lot to recommend itself. So um, it really celebrates that culture and it's lovely to see. Um, and the storyline itself is very good. Like I said, this, this girl does not think she's special. It turns out she's the most special. She just doesn't know it. Um, there's a family dynamic, um, there's, there, are, you know, what it means to be special is your gift, what defines you or are you enough? That kind of stuff, kind of heavy, deep questions really liked it. And I think it's great. It's a great movie, not just for girls. I mean, boys will like it too. Um, there certainly are some, you know, some male themes, I guess, like, you know, one of the, one of the sort of plot points is the, is the death of the abuelo. Um, and he's, you know, he kind of drives the narrative in a way. So there certainly are some sort of male elements to it that I think boys can relate to, but it really is a kind of a girl empowerment movie, but in a good way. It's about family. It's about food. It's about finding your voice, finding your, you know, your heart, knowing what's important to you. Um, I really liked it. And like I said, uh, Lin-Manuel Miranda, no one can ever accuse him of not being fantastic uh, as a musician and a writer of songs. He is, he'll, he will go down in history as one of our greats, I believe. So Encanto, I completely recommend it. I'll probably watch it again. I love Disney. So <laughs> this is a good one. And, um, you know, if you liked Moana, who also, I think Lin-Manuel Miranda was the, the writer of those, um, of the music for that as well. And the songs for that. Uh, and of course, Hamilton, if you like that kind of stuff, you will really like Encanto. It's super fun. And it's a lot of, I mean, I actually cried. Okay. I cry about a lot, but I cried. I was like, that's so lovely. I love it. So I recommend it, especially if you have little girls, but I think boys would like it too. Um, okay. Moving on from that and finishing up. So there's been a lot of discussion about Biden deciding, he said it a while ago and he is, you know, making good on it that he is going to choose a black woman for the Supreme Court pick. Um, Justice Breyer retired. I believe Breyer was uh, was chosen by Clinton and um, confirmed. So whoever Biden chooses, they're not going to be replacing a conservative judge. So the balance of the court might not really change too much. But it is a sort of interesting thing that he is, I will only choose a black woman. Um because it actually is so demeaning. It's just so demeaning. It's uh, it's as if he's, a, I mean, I'm, I'm a white woman, so I hope this doesn't offend anyone when I say this, but it's as if he as a white male can just say, and I will, you know, designate this, you know, minority to a place on the Supreme Court in my white power. Excuse me for using that expression. But it's kind of like that, right? Like, it's almost as if he's saying it doesn't really matter what qualifications they might have. It doesn't really matter, you know, if they're the most qualified. And I'm going to talk about that in relation to this sort of phenomenal um, article that showed up in Barry Weiss's, it was a guest article in Barry Weiss's Substack. But I also want to talk about it in relation to, I'm, I'm making my way through Jason Riley's uh, biography um, of Thomas Sowell, and it's called Maverick. It's very, 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 very good. And I can only read it at certain times. I'm so busy all the time. So I, I try to find time during the weekends to kind of get some reading done. And I just recently read this, this one part that just struck me. Um, so I'm going to read it to you a little bit, and then I'm going to read you a little bit of the Barry Weiss substack because they're related, and it's all related to what Biden's doing. Okay, so here's Jason Riley writing in Thomas Sowell's book, Maverick, biography Maverick. Uh, One of the more thoughtful meditations on racial preferences and stigmas is Yale law professor Stephen Carter's Reflections of an Affirmative Action Baby. 
In the 1970s, Carter attended Stanford University as an undergraduate and then applied to Harvard Law School. He was initially rejected, but then received phone calls from school officials who wanted to apologize for the mix-up. Now listen to this. This is what this is what Stephen Carter wrote about this uh, situation that occurred, where they um, they they rejected him initially, but then they said, oh, wait, 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 no, we actually want you. This is what he wrote. They were quite frank in their explanation of the, quote, error. I was told by one official that the school had initially rejected me because, quote, we assumed from your record that you were white. The words have always stuck in my mind, a tantalizing reminder of what is expected of me, which, good Lord, y'all, that's me talking. Good Lord, y'all. Suddenly, Coy writes Carter. He went on to say that the school had obtained, quote, additional information that should have been counted in your favor, end quote. That is, Harvard had discovered the color of my skin. Naturally, I was insulted. Stephen Carter, the white male, was not good enough for Harvard Law. Stephen Carter, the black male, not only was good enough, but rated agonized telephone calls urging him to attend. And Stephen Carter, color unknown, must have been white. How else could he have achieved what he did in college? You see how insulting that is and demeaning that is? Like, it's hard. It's actually not even that hard to put yourself in those shoes because anytime you've ever been insulted by somebody like assuming you couldn't do, I'm a woman, assuming you couldn't do something because you were a girl or didn't understand something because you were a girl or Uh, It happens to me still to this day, frequently, people will try to treat me as if I'm their, you know, assistant or um, scheduler or something like that. And I'm like, "Uh, I have two degrees and I've worked my entire life. I not to have you treat me like, not that there is a damn thing wrong with that work. I've done that work, but I have worked beyond that. And so often when people try to make you feel like you are deserving only of work that you have already surpassed or uh you know put your time in and you've moved beyond that kind of work it 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 is insulting even if you don't want it to be even if you're the kind of person who's like I, I'm not going to let that bother me. It does. It's inte- sometimes it's intended to, sometimes it's not, but it's always a jab, right? It's always it always sticks in you. So It's a really interesting passage there, especially where he says, the words have always stuck in my mind, a tantalizing reminder of what is expected of me. When they said, hey, we didn't want you at first because you were white, but now that we're, we know you're black, we do want you. So that, I, I just, that's just so telling of what is wrong with racial preferences and hiring and things like that. Um, someone put it really well on Twitter today. They said, just because, how did he put it? He said, just because saying that skin color shouldn't be the only reason you choose someone, that is not the same thing as saying that people with different skin colors shouldn't be considered and possibly chosen. Like they're two different things. Um, or that no one, you know, no minority, uh, or black or brown person, Uh, could ever do the job like you're not saying that so it's just there's been some conflation of um sort of it's not I don't hmm, I like the word meritocracy but I think people use that as a negative word they use it as a bad word I think the, the better art the better debate is around whether or not what these sort of preferences are doing and in the Hollywood article which I'll talk about just very briefly in a second it's less it's not necessarily just about skin color although it is it's also about woke sort of social justice stuff and the question that sort of hangs at the end of this article on on woke Hollywood and it, it actually doesn't sort of it does because they leave it with this quote from a guy who basically asks the question is this doing anything for the people it's supposedly trying to help is turning everything into you know social justice preferences woke preferences racial preferences is are the people that are supposed to be benefiting from that are they benefiting or is it just an act I lean toward the latter because there have been so there's so much evidence to to show that, you know, 
especially in this Substack article, there's a lot of discussion about how, you know, this kind of clubbiness, the white guys club that without question has always existed in Hollywood and other places, um, you know, the white sort of Ivy League club um, that they're just replacing another club with they're, they're moving that club out and putting another club in, which is the, you know, sort of um, inclusion and diversity and equity club, because this entire article is about how you can't do anything now in Hollywood without um, basically, you know, making sure that you are sort of tiptoeing around that club. So um, it's a very, very interesting article in Substack, Substack. And I think I've, I think I've just closed it out and I didn't mean to do that. So let me find it again. Um, yeah, I totally did. <laughs> I must have closed it out. Uh, let's see. Hollywood's new rules. Okay. Um, yes. And the subhead is, the old boys club is dead, but a new one with its own litmus tests and landmines is rapidly replacing it. This is all going to end in a giant class action lawsuit. So this is a great article. It came out in early January. I saw it floating around. I read it. But I think in relation to what Biden is doing, well, by just saying, you know, I'm going to pick a black woman and that's it and that's all. Um, it's really sort of, it's worth another look. Um Basically, what this article is saying that is that in Hollywood, um, people are like not getting hired anymore. It's like the it, basically it's racism um, taking the form of sort of woke hiring practices, um, and it is replacing the old boys club with this new club. So okay, so maybe some people say, well, it's about time. You know, maybe it's not the club that they had a problem with. It was the the color of the club or whatever. Okay, that's fine, but let's just be honest about that. But again, I ask, again, the question that always comes to mind for me is, is it doing anything? Is it helping anything? Is it doing what it's supposed to be doing? I mean, I'm a sort of a policy person, so that's a very important question to me. Um, and this, this is from Kevin Parker from this article, a black talent manager at Artists First. Um who said the skeptics of the sort of, um, you know, like woke uh, direction, I guess, in Hollywood missed the point. He says, quote, this whole diversity thing, it's about money, Parker said. Artists First represents some of the most successful black people in Hollywood, including Jordan Peele, Tiffany Haddish, Regina Hall, Kenya Bar Barris, the creator of Blackish, and Marshall Todd, a co-creator of Woke. Recently, the firm moved from its old digs in Beverly Hills to a bigger office in Century City. He says, it's good business to tell more stories from different perspectives. And that's all this really is. Okay, fair enough. I take that point. I think that that's, that's certainly a truth. But then why is everything wrapped in? And I think that's good, by the way. I think that everything should be um, telling. There's a lot. As my grandmother used to say, it takes all kinds to make the world go round. So you just can't act like it's just your bubble that's interesting. So I take his point there. But they're wrapping everything in not just here we're going to tell these other stories. They're wrapping everything in... You know, you have to tell these other stories or you're racist or you don't care about, you know, millennials or you don't care about women or you don't care. Right. And there's this really interesting uh, paragraph in this article that I want to read. Movies and shows, this is the paragraph, movies and shows that were once widely acclaimed but are now verboten, writers and directors said, include Blazing Saddles, even though it was co-written by Richard Pryor, one of our genius comedians, The Bad News Bears, even though it featured a multiracial cast, Tootsie, because transgender activists, and Rocky, bad guy cannot be black, a director explained in an email. Nor would The Wizard of Oz get greenlit. The Munchkins, forget it, the director said. Nor would All in the Family, probably the most influential show of the 1970s. Archie Bunker, the main character, is basically a Trump voter, a producer explained. South Park, which debuted in 1997, has been grandfathered in. Otherwise, no way, another producer said. Okay, 
that list of shows that would not be made today is, I mean, what a tragedy if those shows couldn't be made. Archie Bunker in particular, that they say that he was a Trump voter. He would, he wasn't the, the hero of that show. Um, it was an exploration of a man with biases who had to learn to deal with a changing world. That's what was brilliant about it. And I'm not even going into how brilliant Blazing Saddles was. Um, that probably, you know, Mel Brooks probably helped advance, uh, you know, um, harmony between the races with that one movie more than any, you know, government program has ever done. So, I, again, I just have the question, is any of this stuff doing what it's supposed to do to benefit the people it's supposed to benefit? And is Hollywood itself still doing what it's supposed to do, which is telling the stories of Americans? Um, I'm not sure either one of those things are happening. Um, I just, I'm not sure. I, there has been some interesting material c coming out of Hollywood and, you know, on streaming, but everything seems to be packaged in, you know, these sort of, um, they're telling you what to think about it before you ever even start the show. Like, this is what this is about, and this is what you should think about it. The, the titles, the one show they talk about is called Woke. Okay, so yeah, I just I don't know, guys. I don't think it's actually I, don't, I think the answer to both of those questions is no. I don't think it's helping anybody. And I don't think it's actually um, doing I think I don't think it's actually helping further what Hollywood has always done really well, which is tell the story of Americans um, or just of people in general, not always just Americans, but I mean, in the early days, maybe, but just, you know, the human condition. That's what great art does. It talks about the human condition. And I think we're trying to plug that human condition into a little box and um, make it fit a certain set of parameters. And I think that that's not great art. <laughs> That's not going to do much. Um, so anyway, those are just my thoughts on it. Um, and that's not to say that some of the stuff that's coming out that is sort of trying to adhere to those parameters, we're still getting good stuff some, sometimes. I, I think that that's nothing's ever, you know, 100% one way one, or, you know, 0% the other. Like there's all, it's always a spectrum, right? But I think it is interesting to especially since I've been reading this Thomas Sowell book to sort of, you know, recognize that a lot of these initiatives and a lot of these um, sort of, you know, uh, like I said, these parameters that, that everything's being, you know, framed with, it was nice to hear someone be honest about it and say, no, it's about money, which is good. That's at least honest and can't fault anybody for wanting to make money. Um, I just wish it wasn't wrapped in this like no 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 we're doing the right we're as my sister always says because she's a she works in theater in Atlanta and they had a play that they put on once and one of the lines and it was about this kind of thing was I'm gonna do a good one for the red man okay I would just wish everything wasn't wrapped in that where they're gonna do a good one for the red man and I guess that's where I'm gonna end the show today uh you guys Thanks for listening as always, and um, I'm going to take my dog out and try to make a little bit of this fine, beautiful day outside. Take care of yourselves. Take care of each other. Be kind. Be strong. Be safe. Uh, try to laugh, and we will talk again next week. The FCB Radio Network, first class broadcasting worldwide.